What's up everyone, I'm your host Frigid Phoenix, and welcome to episode 2 of Nostella Lost, the series where I play a game from my past or a game that I never got the chance to experience and give it an honest overview. This time we'll be tackling Quest 64 for the Nintendo 64. You better brew a strong cup of tea for this one, because it's going to be a doozy. Quest 64 was created by Imagineer and published by THQ in 1998. It was one of the first RPGs on the Nintendo 64, a console that became infamous for having basically no RPGs. That was only made worse by the fact that it was the successor to the Super Nintendo, which is practically an RPG factory with the likes of Final Fantasy, Chrono Trigger, Mario RPG, among others. Although it was the first in a very short series of quest games, because it was the first RPG on the follow-up to the Super Nintendo, it had big shoes to fill. And for a while I could tell there was some anticipation for the game. However, nowadays the game is pretty obscure, not completely forgotten, but you don't hear people talking about it in the same breath as Final Fantasy and so on. So what happened? Did it become a hidden gem, or is there a reason it was forgotten? First I want to talk about my history with the game. It was probably around 2001 or so. Uh, I was really into anything to do with magic. Harry Potter, the first movie, had just come out. And I was also really into a show called Card Captors. Someone saw this game and rented it for me for a weekend. Being only 7 at the time, I filled in a lot of the blanks of the story. And I mean a lot, but I'll go into that in a moment. I just thought it was cool being able to summon boulders and fire from my wooden stick. The only problem is that little did we know, you need a memory card to save the game. For some reason, this is one of the only games for the console to absolutely require a memory card to save the game. Some games had the option to save to a memory card instead of the cartridge uh, if you chose to do so, which I thought was really stupid until the battery backup for my Perfect Dark cartridge died. Now, to be fair, the game box does tell you that you need a memory card to save, but we weren't given that box when we rented it. So I ended up renting it about three more times trying to get through the game in one sitting. The game is something like 10 to 15 hours long, but by the end of it, all my hard work, my blood, sweat, and tears, my strategies paid off. I made it to the second area. I was a stubborn kid, so down the line I eventually bought the game and a memory card. Trying so hard to only get that far because of a physical constraint such as not having a memory card made my beef with this game personal. When you start up the game, you have an intro that gives you most of the backstory to the world. Wait a second, what's up with this hair? I have annoying cowlicks that cause my hair to stick off, sure. But holy shit, you could poke someone's eye out with that. Basically, the land is divided up into three kingdoms that, due to a treaty, have enjoyed peace. However, one night, the Elatail book is stolen and throws the land into peril. Once you start, you're greeted to Grand Abbot, explaining to your character, Brian, that he has begged you not to go, but you insist on finding your father, Lord Bartholomew, who left in search for the Elateo book a month ago and hasn't returned. You're reminded that although you have wonderful powers, you're just a child, and so the path ahead will be hard. The spells you start with I wouldn't describe as wonderful, more so I'd describe them as absolute shit. Then with a little more exposition, it is explained that the book has power that exceeds human knowledge, which begs the question, who made it if no one can understand it? This all-powerful book was taken from the monastery's crypt. But why isn't there any sign of conflict here? Wasn't anyone guarding this book, or did the thief just walk in, grab it, and walk out? If you don't get this book back, the world will fall under a day of grief. Only a day, though. After that, it's smooth sailing. Then you're on your way. As a side note, does anyone else find this guy's model especially bad? Growing up, I found he looked more like an alien unicorn than a human, and honestly, I still feel that way. So now you begin your slow descent out of the monastery. There's absolutely nothing to do in this place to the point that it kind of feels unfinished, which will find it to be a recurring theme throughout this game. There's a hallway with a long row of doors, each you can go into, but only the first one has anything in it. There's a person in that room who simply tells you that your staff and spells are your only defense, which means you won't be getting a 12 gauge shotgun at any point. There's one door without a handle that I previously assumed you couldn't go into because it lacks a handle. But if you enter, there's not only two people, but another room with and three dewdrops to collect through all of them. Dewdrops are incredibly useful at this point in the game because they recover magic points, or MP, so you can cast more spells. Given that only one attack in this game isn't a spell, you're going to be using a lot of magic. Though that one attack, using your staff, is pretty powerful, to be fair. 
Speaking of spells, this game has an interesting system for dealing with them. You have four elements at your disposal, earth, wind, water, and fire, which can be assessed using the C buttons. You gain new spells by leveling up the respective elements, which can be done by battling or picking up spirits in the overworld which are little puffs of smoke. You level up one element at a time, though you can choose which one to level up. Each element stands out compared to the other elements, but it's completely unbalanced. If you want the easiest run through the game, you'll only be focusing on earth and water. Earth gives you attacks such as Avalanche that can hit multiple targets multiple times, dealing possibly hundreds of damage per turn. It also has Magic Barrier which makes you immune to all magic attacks for 3 turns, which makes you an unstoppable wall as 99% of enemy attacks are magic based. You'll want water because it's the only healing spell in the game and a spell that helps you escape battles. Fire has a screen nuke but only after getting to level 40 out of a max of 50 with no other very good uh, skills to make the arduous task of leveling up very worth it. Wind has a lot of range attacks, but so does Earth, which does more damage anyway. So you're best off just sticking with Earth. You want a healing spell from water because this game somehow manages to simultaneously have unlimited healing items and scarce healing items. Shops, and I put that in massive quotes, give everything away for free because of a lack of currency in this society. However, only if you have no bread. Can you imagine if in real life you went to a store and were told, Sorry, I can't let you buy that loaf of bread. You still have the crust from the last loaf at home. The same goes for wings, another item that is just given to you. Wings teleport you back to the town you got them in, provided you're not in a dungeon. However, each town has a different color, so you can have multiple colors at once. Each town also has an inn, which serves both as a full restore point and a save spot. It's nice that you can use this for free. The last inn you rest at serves as your respawn point should you die along the way. And if you decide to ignore inns throughout the entire game, then your respawn point will be the monastery where you started. So if you decide to go through the entire game and die at the very last area, you're all the way back. After leaving the monastery, you'll find yourself in the first town. Entering the inn here lets you meet one of the only recurring characters in this game, a wandering traveler who's following the same path as you, Shannon. Spoiler alert, Chen stole the Yellow Tail book. The elusive thief that your father has gone missing hunting down hasn't even left town. To rub things in even more, she appears in every inn through Brian's quest, meaning you potentially talk to her dozens of times, and Brian is none the wiser. Also, if you think that Shannon is cleverly following Brian to learn about him and his abilities and how to counter them to lead to the most epic final boss encounter of this holy magic century, nope. She just hands you the book before the final area. What? Towns don't serve a whole lot of purpose, which is a shame because some of them are pretty interesting aesthetically and have their own feelings to them, such as this very rich town of mansions about halfway through the game, or this town that was destroyed by one of the big bads just because he was flexing his muscles. Other than the inns and shops, there's locals you can talk to, but they don't really say anything. You can find a few scattered spirits and items, but sometimes uh, they are just in random houses that are so far out of the way of where you want to be, there's not really much of a point. So what about outside the towns? You're greeted to a huge field of nothing, it's just a path to your next destination. Traveling off the beaten path occasionally gives you a spirit, or you might find a house with generally nothing in it, but there are so few of those anyway that it's barely worth it. The actual size of the field is a problem, but the biggest problem here, dare I say one of the most annoying problems in this game, is the thousands of enemies waiting to ruin your day. This game has the highest encounter rate of any game I have ever played. Often just taking a couple of steps will put you in another fight. This footage that you're looking at right now is the actual encounter rate. On top of that, enemies very rarely are caught alone, sometimes being in simply massive groups of six or more. The battle system is a mix of turn-based and roaming. You choose an attack, but you must position yourself before you choose it so that you can make sure it will hit anything. The game doesn't tell you how a spell behaves except for the name of the spell, meaning you must adjust your attack's range through trial and error, as there is no indicators of what targets it will hit. The only exception to this is the staff which shows an icon above an enemy if you're close enough to hit them. However, that requires you to get up close and personal with them, making dodging basically impossible. Only one enemy attacks per round, and while the attack animation is playing, you can move Brian, making it possible to dodge. 
You can use the L button to use items, but this takes up a turn. The battlefield is two octagons. The first is the range of movement you can do that turn. It adjusts according to your position at the beginning of each turn. The second and the bigger octagon is the full battlefield. Walking out of the battlefield will give you the option to escape. This is a unique system for me, though I'm admittedly not a huge uh, RPG player. It can be drawn out because some of the enemies move slower than the continents, but I like being able to move and try to dodge, and there's some strategy to aiming and choosing targets. Every enemy has their own assigned element, however I don't really know what that means. Enemies often use spells that don't fit their element, and also I can't tell if there's a system uh, where you get a bonus or a nerf to your attack power if you use certain elements against certain enemies. It feels like they miss an obvious level of strategy by not having this. Once I get Avalanche, I'm able to breeze through all fights with just that anyways. Onto that point is the difficulty. I have never in my entire life played a game with such a messed up difficulty curve. The very beginning is sort of a middle ground, it isn't a pushover, but you won't be tearing your hair out. Then you reach the first forest, where the shit beater gets cranked. Enemies here hit hard, and the actual dungeon is designed in a way that you're going to be wandering around a lot, so you're going to be fighting a lot of unnecessary battles. There's two branching paths, but it's so easy to get turned around because everything looks the same. But the real pain in the ass is the first boss, Solvering. This bitch right here is why, after all my efforts, I was only able to make it through the second area of the game. This guy has a lot of HP for this part of the game. High defense, and two attacks. He has a long range attack that's a laser beam. It isn't too bad if it hits you, and it isn't that hard to dodge. As for his other attack, holy shit. This rock wall of death takes up so much of the battlefield, and if you get hit, it's game over. Look how much damage it does. If you manage to survive, don't you worry, because this guy can do this attack an infinite number of times. Unfortunately, if you think you can just keep your distance so you'll use the laser attack, you're in for a bad time. If even one pixel of this attack can hit, he is almost guaranteed to use it against you. But you need to stay close enough so that you can even hit him, so you can't stay on the opposite side of the field. Come to this fight stocked up the best you can, avoid using any healing and magic items, Use your healing spell right before the fight, and run in circles to be at max MP. Carefully tread along the edges of the boss room to collect all the items, and prepare for a war of attrition. You do so low damage at this point, you will be here for a while even if you manage to get him on your first try. You're best off grinding to make this easier. I already discussed how you level up your magic spells by collecting spirits or fighting, and each spirit adds a little bit to how effective that element is. But you also have stats, HP, Agility, Defense, and MP. You level up these by doing certain actions. Agility you level up by running, MP through casting spells, Defense and HP both level up from you taking damage. So after you beat the first boss, you get the Elemental Orb. You collect these after each major boss, but really they're just plot points and don't actually affect anything in terms of gameplay. You're basically told, hey, this controls the elements, and since they have been stolen, bad things are going down. The rest of the game follows the same formula. You go to a new area, fight some new enemies, get told shit's going down, and are pointed in the right direction. Or not. Often you just have to wander because nothing stands out. No characters approach you, you might get some clues by basically listening to gossip, but this is the biggest problem with the plot, it just isn't told to you. The game started off strong with an entire cutscene about the backstory, but after you, that you get so little. You get the most from Shannon, but let me tell you, I never spoke to her my first time through the full game. You can easily walk by 90% of the plot. When you make a game, it is fine to leave some things up for imagination, or to require some exploration to get the full story, but this takes it way too far. The only way you're getting the full story is if you explore every nook and cranny, talk to and listen to every NPC, and then you still might be lost. The thing is, in such a large but empty game, this is an absolute chore. This unfortunately extends to the primary goal of the game. Remember the whole thing about looking for your father? You do find him, but you can literally walk by him and not notice. He's just kind of sitting there in the corner of some room near the end of the game. Your father is barely even mentioned up to this point too. It's like they forgot that one of the only plot points in the game. Plus, don't forget that the book you're looking for is also just given to you. When you're given the book, you're told of the big bad of the game. Mammoth. 
While you're only told about the final boss with exception to maybe some very small references beforehand, about 20 minutes before you fight him is beyond me. And holy shit, this game was hiding this demon from me. So if the story in this RPG is non-existent, what else does the game have to offer you? You don't need an amazing story to have a great game. Paper Mario has a pretty simple plot, but that game is a classic. Well, this story has repetition, that's for sure. Graphically, the game is fine. The colors are bright, some places manage scale really well making the place seem massive and not in an empty way like the fields. Most models are fine, though there are a few exceptions. Brian has a distinctive look, enemies are varied and there are some pretty cool designs, though background NPCs tend to look like lifeless mannequins. Though, while I'm talking about graphics, I just want to point out the hellhounds that look pretty scary in the game are shown as this on the box art. My biggest complaint with the graphics is the lack of variation in textures and environments in general. This leads to unintentional backtracking and getting absolutely lost in dungeons where you don't get a map. This is at its absolute worst in the last cave of the game, Boy Hole, which is just a bunch of brown hallways and some lakes of lava. But there's been times when I thought I was at the end of the level only to find out that I backtracked out of the level. Now let's talk about the music. It's catchy and has a lot of Celtic vibes, which is what the setting seems to be based off being called Celtland and all. There's a lot of lively upbeat tracks which are common in fields and towns, despite the Holy Plains track being played through a whole lot of the game. I actually never got sick of it. The battle theme is really quick and tense and is one of my favorite battle themes in a video game. Plus there's plenty of atmospheric themes that suit the dungeons and help build really good atmosphere. The music, although not the best tunes in video game history, make the experience of playing this game much more enjoyable. Some personal favorite tunes of mine are Normu, Crystal Valley, and the battle theme, to name a few. So you've collected the elemental items, took a quick glance at your father, had the main plot item given to you, fought the guy who always skips a leg day, and dealt with the real big bad of this game, Monotony. What do you get for an ending? Scrolling text. There's some stuff about the world being saved, but this is extremely underwhelming. However, the Japanese version, which according to DuckDuckGo is Donkey Kong 64, has a full-blown cutscene to show that everything is alright. I'm not sure why it's exactly said because I can't read Japanese, but I'll take my sources' word for it. Actually, the Japanese version has a lot of differences and is much easier. Enemies drop items much more frequently, you deal more damage, your abilities increase faster, the bloody first boss does less damage, so they knew this was a problem. So what's my final verdict? Quest 64 is a game of missed potential. I do get some legitimate enjoyment out of the game. I think the environments do often look nice, f repetitive, the music's catchy, and the battle and element system are really involved and fun. It also has a lot of makings of a good game, but it's crippled by the barely existent story, the repetitiveness, and the strange difficulty curve where it randomly ramps up in difficulty in the first half, and after that becomes very easy. Basically a pushover. The game feels rushed, and if the Japanese version, which came out a year later, is any indication, some more tweaking in time could have fixed a lot of these problems. I have a hard time recommending this game to everyone, but it isn't so bad to be avoided. Unless you want to buy the game new, then I'd say forget it even exists. I say if you're really into RPGs or obscure games, then give it a look. If you're new to RPGs, it might be good to check it out too because it's pretty easy to understand. But if you're an RPG veteran or what I showed you just didn't interest you, then skip the game. And with that, I'll wrap up this episode of Nostal Loss. I hope you all enjoyed it. Leave a comment and a like down below. Let me know how I did, and I hope to see you all soon. Take care.